Good morning, all. Welcome to Old South here in Hollowell. We welcome you to worship. And we always begin with our, our message of no matter who you are, where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. Amen. Join us for worship. Blessed are you poor who have no work or too little income. God has promised, yours is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you who are hungry now. God has promised you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep over unpaid bills, the loss of a job, or your children's lack of opportunities. God has promised you shall be comforted. You shall laugh. Blessed are you who are merciful. God has promised you shall receive mercy. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for justice. God has promised you shall be filled. The time is surely coming when God's justice and peace shall reign throughout the land. Thanks be to God. Be among us this day, we humbly pray, as we continue in prayer, speaking the words that Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and, and the glory, glory forever. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke 17, 11 through 19. Jesus cleanses 10 lepers. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to them, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Good morning. Good morning. My message is uh, a plea for each of us to ask God to show us mercy. And God always comes through. I love this reading um, because it talks about many things that we as people of faith, as people of the way, should be thinking about with our devotions and our prayers, our service, our gifts, and our commitment to God. Our faith has changed us. Given that Samaria and Galilee, they border each other, there, there is no region in between them. And all roads lead to Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way there to the cross, and the encounters he has along the way reveal something about the nature of the kingdom he will establish there. This encounter happens in a middle space where one would expect tension between ethnic and religious differences. They both share their region, but they're different parts of the region. Samaria to the north, Jerusalem to the south, sort of like Augustine Gardner. Uh, people of the same region, but you have very different ways of seeing things. And the events that happen in the scene are pretty typical, but neither the pattern of healing or the, the plea and the response from the worship from the one who returns to praise, to prostrate and thank is unique. Both are reliable elements in Jesus's healing stories. God acts in and through the ordinary, but two details stand out. Jesus has commanded the 10 to follow the law. His question seems leading. Where are the other nine to the one who has returned? But they are just going to do the things that Jesus has commanded them to do, to go see the priests according to the law. Then why does Jesus ask, where are the other nine? The one who returns is, is a Samaritan, or as Jesus describes him, a foreigner. That is, one a first century Jew would not normally look to as an example. Amid the ordinary, something has changed. Jesus says to the Samaritan, your faith has made you well. Or as others might change and translate it, your faith has healed and saved you. It could also be translated as you have been healed and made well and saved. Or it could also be, according to the King James Version, your faith has made you whole. However we translate it, one thing is clear. There's much more at stake and happening here than just a healing. These details help us to understand the possibility that as Jesus instructs his followers then and now, that faith is not only a matter of believing, but also of seeing. All the lepers were healed. One, however, saw, noticed, and let what happened sink in, and it made all the difference. Because he sees what has happened, the leper recognizes Jesus, his reign and his power. Because he sees what has happened, the leper has something for which to be thankful, praising God with a loud voice. Because he sees what has happened, the leper changes direction, veering from his course toward a priest 
to first return to Jesus. This story is an invitation to all believers then and now to recognize that what we see makes all the difference. In the face of adversity, do we see danger or opportunity? In the face of human need, do we see demand or gift? In the face of the stranger, do we see potential enemy or friend? When we look to God, we might see a stern judge or we might see a loving parent. When we look to ourselves, do we see failure or beloved child of God? When we look to the future, do we see fearful uncertainty or an open horizon? There is, of course, no right answer to any of these questions. How we might answer them depends on what we see. Because he sees what has happened, the leper is not just healed, but is made whole. He is restored. He is drawn back into relationship with God and humanity. In all these ways, he has seen and he has been saved. What is true stewardship and worship and Christian living? It is the 10th leper turning back. For now as then, seeing makes all the difference. Is the, if there is a persistent theme throughout the gospel, according to Luke, it is that Jesus goes into places and spaces otherwise thought to be unclean and even unwise by the rulers and the good people of the day. It seems that Jesus is often in the in-between space, inhabited by people who have been marginalized by the wider society and by churches and religious culture of their time. Jesus encounters these who have been labeled as lepers. In this in-between geography, these people who have been defined as unclean existed often together in colonies or enough away from others as not to be a threat to the health of the community, but close enough away that they had to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean. They existed by begging from the margins in order to survive throughout this shared misery and misfortune. It is into the space that Jesus intentionally travels on his way to Jerusalem, where he will also experience the anguish of separation from those he loves. But before Jerusalem, he finds himself in this in-between space, having come near a colony of those that were captured by rulers of the day. Instead of yelling for food or yelling out their unclean status, as would have been required by the law, these 10 lepers yelled out for something far greater. They call out for mercy. They call out to be seen in their suffering by the one whom they trust will see them and act for their healing so that they might be set free from the present prison from which they live. Jesus sees in each leper what God sees. Beloved children yearning to be free from everything that was holding them hostage to the rules of the day and from the fullness of flourishing that is the birthright of all God's beloved children. Jesus sends them to the priest for reunion with the community they have longed to rejoin, himself trusting that God's power would activate a possibility between the poverty of the body and of the spirit and their daily reality. I was reflecting on this reading this week um, and thinking about our conversations after church last week. And I couldn't help thinking, thank you folks for coming and being part of the conversation. But as I have been praying about it and thinking about it, I've thought, well, where are the rest of the people that used to fill the pews? Where are the other nine, the 99, the 999, the people that used to be right here with all of you elbow to elbow? praying together, worshiping together, and many of them who had many beautiful traditions and celebrations in their families and in their lives. If they had seen and taken God into their hearts and their lives, why aren't they here? It's a good question that really bears prayer and conversation. But part of this is also asking, how can we reach out to those others who are not here? How can we keep connected, whether it's by Zoom 
or whether it's some other way with phone calls or cards or notes, or as we see people at the grocery store, the post office to say, you know, we miss you. It's good to see you. How are you? And this busy, hectic life we all live in, it is so important that we take time for each other and take time to check in and say, well, how are you on your journey? And is there something I can do to help? Is there something we can do to help? These are questions that not just this church, but I promise you uh, the majority of churches in the state of Maine are asking themselves or should be asking themselves. Where are the people that used to be in the pews? And how do we bring more people in? How do we make sure that the, the church life of Old South is still so vital and so important? So it's not just the one who turns back. Maybe we'll bring in the other nine or the other 99 or the other folks that used to gain so much by being here. And who I am quite certain over the years have been blessed by wonderful ministers and wonderful people who really change people's lives. This is one of those questions, uh, you know, I, I've often liked to ask people I, I've been in conversation with in church because it really bears revisiting and considering how has God blessed and changed and saved us? I shared a story, I think a couple months ago about a gentleman I visited on a visit in the hospital and he asked me to save him. And my recurring question was, and so how will this change you? How will God blessing your life and touching your life and saving you, what will be different? Clearly for the one we read about today, he had to turn back and say, thank you. My God, my God, my life has changed. My life is so much better. I'm no longer going to be shunned in this leper colony. I'm gonna be able to be part of the life of the community. These are some pretty dramatic ways that we read about this person who really had his life transformed. But I can tell you, I can stand before you as a witness that my faith has changed my life. The questions we used to ask, I've always been kind of a half, half glass, half full kind of person my whole life. But truly, as I think about the conversations about the church and what we're trying to accomplish together, you know, I don't focus on the 99. I focus on the ones who are in the pews. I focus on the people that are here and everybody I encounter and everybody I talk to. And so I, I asked that gentleman who was at the end of his life in a hospital bed and quite despondent, how would your faith in being saved in your connection with God, how will you live your life differently? And we live in a time when we're all trying to be polite. We're all trying to be careful about the things we say and not to offend folks. And, and that's important. It's very, very important. But at times, I worry that we sort of hide our faith. We tuck it away as not to infringe on someone else's beliefs or how they live their life. And to be clear, I believe in a big, wide, open tent for all God's children. But at the same time, how are they gonna know you're a person of faith? Do you do it by the words you share, by the attention that you give, by the ways that you volunteer and serve others? by the way, that you just show up to be with people in their times of need. There's no wrong answer. But like the one who has turned back, he showed up. And I believe that's what God is calling for us today, to think about how are we going to keep showing up? How are we going to be showing people how God has changed and transformed our lives? I've been a very blessed person long before I really knew and claimed that I was a blessed person. And I'm so deeply thankful that God never gave up on me. It took me a long time to stop just thinking, well, I'll just be a good person, but to connect it with my faith. 
and to my God to be the center and the leader of my life. And so the things that I do, I'm constantly asking, well, is, who is this serving? Is this serving me? Is this serving my neighbor? Is this serving my family? Is this serving God? Who does this serve? And again, most importantly, how does our faith come out to other people? And how do we use that to bless others? It's a big question. It's a big invitation. And it's, it's a great opportunity. As I move to close this message this morning, you know, we are the day before the Indigenous Peoples Day here in Maine. And so I lift that up because like the Samaritans, there are many people I can think of not that long ago, my family, we uh, were a temporary foster care shelter for a variety of young people. And I can remember some folks that came from the Orno area that were placed with us for a couple of weeks and asking my mom, well, why can't they be with their own parents? What's going on in their own families? So this is roughly 40 years ago. And my own family, that we took in kids that were removed from their families. Because somebody said, well, it's better to get these kids out of these homes and we'll try to re-educate them and show them a different way of living. But we also removed them from their communities. We removed them from their cultures. And I encourage you, if you have not read about it yet, at the annual conference that's coming up next Saturday for the main conference, they will be talking about uh, there are some initiatives to really recognize the native people of Maine, to recognize that they should have rights and opportunities to celebrate their culture, to celebrate their history, and most importantly, to have sovereignty over their own land, their own communities and the people that they're trying to bring to and keep those communities whole. There's a whole lot of history out there about ways that the, the native peoples have lost land, have lost control, have been um, taken advantage of, have been really not been treated well many, many times over the years but I am proud to stand here before you and say, I had written a paper in, uh, I think it was 1981, about Senator Edmund Muskie and President Jimmy Carter, the first in the nation to really recognize the native people of Maine and to try to begin a conversation about restoring some rights and to extend some apologies and to take some ownership for ways that we have not always treated the native people well. So I encourage you, read about the, the, the principles that are being put before folks uh, next Saturday. And for us to think about, you know, all the ways that we've been invited as citizens of the great state of Maine to think about how we have named things over the years, how we have depicted people over the years. And as somebody who lived in Skowhegan uh, for about six years, um, I can tell you, it was the hot and spicy conversation in Skowhegan. And it still is because, uh, you know, there's just not widespread agreement about what is fair and appropriate for us as non-natives, as non-Native Americans to be appropriating images and names of, of these precious cultures. So I'm proud that across Maine, there's been a lot of work on this. And most importantly, that we have sort of turn the page on just focusing on Columbus, but also looking at the other side of the history, which was the people that we took land from, people who made it possible for us to have the opportunities that we have had in the great state of Maine and across New England. So as I close, I invite you to really pray hard and think about Jesus's message to the Samaritans. And all the ways God is trying to reach into our lives and, and do great things in and through us. And most importantly, to have mercy for us. Because one of the things that always makes me love God more is that, you know, God knows all the ways I'm going to trip, 
I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say things I shouldn't always say. I'm going to be inconsiderate at times and, and just not do the things that I really should do. God loves me anyway. God has mercy for all of us and loves us anyway. And as I've shared before, one of my favorite messages from one of my mentors, you know, remember, there's nothing we could ever do that's going to make God love us any less. And there's nothing we could ever do that's going to make God love us anymore. God just loves us. Amen. Four oh four. on your way. Your faith has made you whole. Faith has great power. It can bring healing to those who believe. Healing of the body and healing of the spirit. Our faith can move us to reach out and to share that healing with others. So let us reach out today and all this week with gifts of ourselves and of our treasures through our outreach fund, our gifts to the church, our words and actions as we go about our lives this week. As we celebrate the mercy of God and our great love from him, let us take time to consider all the ways we have been blessed and called to share our blessings with those in need and to support the work that God is calling us to do across our community. Let the offering be taken.
Let us gather in silent prayer. I will yield all the hard places of my heart to the softening influence of the Spirit of God. Despite my pride, my pain, and my vanity, I will yield every stubborn bit of this difficult piece of my heart to God until he makes my heart whole, one united with the Holy Spirit. It will not be easy, not simple, but here in the quietness, I give up to God all the lumps and unresolved bits of me, the humble spirit and the contrite heart. Thou givest to him who seekest with true devotion. Lord, watch over us and all the prayers that have been lifted before you. We give great thanks for all the blessings we have received. We go forward in faith. Amen. The next hymn this morning is number 430 from the New Century Hymnal. Praise to God, your praises bring, number 430. As we prepare to close this time of fellowship, I am reflecting on the people of the dawn, the Micmac, the Maliseet, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, and the Abenaki. This is a Native American prayer. Praise our creator, O me which give thanks to the maker, for Turtle Island nurtures us. Love lives forever in ancestors dancing in the Aurora Borealis. Who can truth talk the mighty doings of the creator or drum all his praise? Joyful are those who observe justice 
who work for right relations at all times. Remember me, O oh great spirit, when you show honor to your people. Help me when you lead us places of protection. I see the grateful hunting of creatures, generous gathering and abundant harvest, prosperity of our clans, that I may dance in the ceremonies of our nation's people, that I may glory in your ancestry. Amen. Thank you.